Mesoblast is a uh, company that uh, is committed to bringing cellular medicines to uh, the market for intractable, serious, and life-threatening diseases. We are a publicly traded company. Our mission is committed to uh, bringing to market these disruptive cellular medicines to treat serious and life-threatening illnesses. Our cellular medicine platform is based on mesenchymal lineage cells. These are cells that have receptors that respond to activating inflammatory and damaged tissue, tissue signals. And in response to these signals, the cells secrete a variety of biomolecules which are then responsible for immunomodulation and tissue repair. The multimodal mechanisms of action target multiple pathways, and the mesenchymal precursor cell product is at the apex of the MLC hierarchy, and their immunoselection provides a homogeneous population of potent cells. Our technology is positioned for scalable industrialized manufacturing. The cells are immune privileged and uh, requires them to be used uh, off the shelf. They are allogeneic products, but they do not require matching or recipient immunosuppression. Uh, the manufacturing process includes culture expansion, which is scalable to produce anticipated commercial uh, quantities. And the management know-how and regulatory activities has uh, facilitated the translation to date and is uh, moving forward with activities to prepare for product launch. If successful, we believe one of our products, MSC 100 IV, will likely be the first allogeneic mesenchymal lineage product registered for sale in the United States. We have a strong uh, intellectual property portfolio, which consists of uh, over 800 patents covering 69 patent families across multiple jurisdictions. And now I'd like to spend a minute or two on our pipeline. We have a number of programs that we call Tier 1. These are programs where our resources are committed. And the first one I'll briefly touch on is the MPC 150 IM product that is being evaluated in two uh, programs in cardiovascular medicine. The first of them is a phase three program of um, MPCs in class two and three heart failure patients where the cells are delivered uh, by catheter, so it's an endomyocardial delivery. That program, as I mentioned, is in phase three and is expected to complete enrollment later this year. The second program is evaluating the use of these cells in uh, patients with class four heart failure who have had a left ventricular assist device placed. Um, the cells are implanted at the time of surgery. We have recently announced that a phase 2B study of 159 patients has completed enrollment and we're expecting data later this year on that program. We're also in phase three in a program evaluating a dose of our cells for chronic low back pain where patients who have failed to respond to conservative me measures uh, receive an injection of cells into the disk space. This is a randomized control trial and we've announced that that phase three program has recently completed enrollment. Additionally, we've uh, conducted phase two studies in rheumatoid arthritis as well as in diabetes and diabetic nephropathy. And lastly, I'd like to spend a little bit of time speaking about our acute graft versus host disease program. This is a program where we are using intravenous infusions of the cells in, in pediatric patients who have failed to respond to steroids for the treatment of acute graft versus host disease. As many of you know, this is a devastating complication of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and patients who do not respond to steroids have a, a, a very, very poor uh, outcome. We've recently completed enrollment in a phase three single arm study of pediatric patients. We've announced that we have met the primary endpoint, which is successful overall response rate. The actual rate was 69%, and that was statistically significant compared to a historical rate control. This study is now completing uh, data collection and uh, full study readout is expected uh, mid-June. Uh, we have previously met with the FDA about this program, the study design, and the regulatory pathway. It is expected to be a program on an accelerated approval pathway, and it is an orphan indication. The MSC product is currently on the market in Japan under our license agreement with JCR Pharmaceutical. 
I'd like to just then reiterate our, reiterate our targeted milestone, milestones and catalysts over the coming months. The pediatric graft versus host disease program, uh, day 100 survival and day 180 survival and safety data are due later this year. The heart uh, failure programs, the class 2-3 program will, uh, is anticipated to complete enrollment later this year. And the LVAD trial is expected to have data readout in Q3 of this year. Our low back pain program, which has uh, recently completed enrollment, continues to follow patients. And we have a number of potential corporate partnerships uh, to uh, consider. So I'll stop there and uh, answer any questions that we may have about the Mesoblast technology platform. Great. Thank you, Donna. So you're, you're obviously in the unique position of being able to speak to um, you know, a program and, and the process of moving from R&D into the clinic into late stage trials and, and then ultimately um, commercialization uh, with, with the example in GBHD. So what do you learn from that process? What can you apply to the rest of the pipeline? What were some of the unique challenges, uh, you know, that you encounter and, and how different is that in Japan, for example, versus uh, U.S.? Well, starting with just some of the challenges in translation in, in these programs, um, as we all know, cellular therapy and regenerative medicine are new fields, they're new in terms of development, and they're certainly new in terms of the regulatory interactions and uh, pathways, as well as expectations in the marketplace. Um, so we, we've had to learn how to be very careful about identifying our indications, be sure that if we're focusing on areas of unmet need that we've done our diligence to understand what that need is today and also to try to project what that will look like in the coming years because as we all know, we start at one date and we finish um, often several years out and so um, the, the medical uh, landscape may change as, as does the uh, marketing landscape. So really working uh, very carefully on our diligence to understand the indication and then looking over time to see where things will be over the next few years. As far as the, um, uh, the, the regulatory landscape across jurisdictions, I think we're all in a great place right now because uh, over the last few years we've seen Japan uh, make some uh, real strides forward in terms of creating a pathway for reg regulatory uh, interactions around regenerative medicines. Uh, we've seen the FDA most recently through the uh, following the 21st Century Cures Act to set out for our MAT designation um, and, and create a defined pathway uh, for regenerative medicines as well. Um, I have such a short time to present this, so I didn't mention that our LVET program has received the RMAT designation, which we consider uh, very insightful for uh, the FDA to allow for special interactions to sort of understand how you identify the regulatory pathway and work with them in something that would, is truly a novel indication. Um, there are other jurisdictions. Europe, of course, has a uh, program prime where uh, they have uh, interactions around accelerated assessments as well. So we're, we're in a good place where there is recognition for trying to expedite development pathways. You know, companies spend lots of years and lots of money trying to get to a place where they can offer uh, something to help the public at large. And, and in terms of where we are in the evolution of some of these regulatory bodies, do you, do you think we're in a good place now or do you think there's a long way to go still for FDA and others to, to adapt to, to some of these newer um, multimodal, more complex cell therapies? Well, I think there will still be some adaptation on the FDA side, but we're certainly in a better place than we were 10 years ago. And uh, although there were not formal programs uh, when we started, there was still interaction with the FDA that was rather um, uh, adjusted for cell therapy development as opposed to conventional drugs. Okay, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Can you just speak a little bit to um, the GBHD program, targeting pediatric patients first, um, and moving into high-risk adult, uh, followed by then chronic patients. Usually with drug discovery, you think about starting in adults, maybe, maybe more advanced patients first, and then mm -hmm. eventually getting to pediatric patients. So uh, maybe just help us understand that progression and, and why that makes sense for that indication and for, for your medicine. So the, the GBHD program 
uh, is a program that we acquired in 2013 when we acquired the prochymal cell line from Osiris Therapeutics. And uh, there was a lot of data that was acquired in pediatric patients through an expanded access program. And it, it, it was a huge program. It eventually enrolled uh, 241 patients. And uh, we certainly saw signals and uh, went to the FDA early to see what we could do with the data that we had in hand and at that time worked out the regulatory pathway for pediatrics. Um, we certainly uh, have plans to extend the label into adults, but moving into children first had to do with the data that we had on hand at the time. Okay, and, and, and in the U.S., do you, you plan to launch GVHD uh, on your own, and, and where are you in terms of uh, preparation for that, in terms of manufacturing, mm -hmm. sales and marketing, um, physician education? Right, so we do plan to launch this program. Um, we had uh, some activity with the expanded access program and then, of course, interactions with all the clinical trial sites. And uh, the majority of, uh, of children who are transplanted are transplanted in uh, high-volume centers. There are actually 15 high-volume transplant centers in the U.S. And then there are other centers that are very active but don't have the highest volumes. And so it's a very well-defined footprint. Uh, we have relationships uh, with these centers. And uh, so we will launch. Obviously, there's uh, a lot of prep to do for a successful launch. Uh, medical education is just one of them, and not just education around the product in this indication, but the product in general, because this is a, is a new product for the industry. Um, in terms of you know manufacturing uh, readiness, we've uh, prepared for this from the time we actually started this phase three program. So. Uh, we've thought all along that this program would be successful and prepared for it. Great, and uh, I know we started a couple minutes late, so uh, I'll just take a few minutes, I think, uh, to go over the originally scheduled time. Um, did you want to speak to the, uh, um, you know, elsewhere in the pipeline, obviously, um, you have many products moving ahead, MPC 150 IM uh, in heart failure. Uh, maybe you wanted to speak to the rationale there and the market opportunity uh, and, and why you think that's a good fit. Certainly. Um, the heart failure, well, the, the cardiovascular indication is something that goes back to uh, the early uh, stages of our company when we were founded. We always had interest in the cardiovascular space, and a lot of that had to do with our understanding of uh, the mesenchymal lineage cells and uh, where we thought they might be best applied. Um, the, the phase three heart failure program was... Uh, initiated after we had uh, a very uh, surprisingly successful phase two program where we saw much more than we would have anticipated in a 60 patient study and we're uh, very eager to uh, embark on a phase three. That program has been enrolling patients for a few years and is expected to complete enrollment at the end of this year. I think that that program combined with um, some of the data that we've published in the LVAD indication as well as uh, the LVAD study that's recently completed enrollment and is analyzing data now will be very informative to us and informative to the market in terms of understanding how uh, mesenchymal cells uh, uh, work in this indication, not only uh, phase two and three heart failure, but the later stage uh, for a heart failure patient. Mm. Great. And just looking ahead, w when you think about a non-immunogenic uh, cell therapy off the shelf, a scalable, um, and, and you look around, for example, the conference today um, with, with new technologies being developed, gene therapy, gene editing, um, is there a potential to leverage um, this type of cell therapy uh, in a combinatorial way with some of these other technologies as either drug delivery, mm -hmm. um, modifying the cells in some other way, delivering cargo. Uh, what's sort of the long-term vision and potential for uh, this type of platform? We've, we've thought about, you know, what the next generation will look like and maybe even the generation after that. Um, obviously, our focus right now is on getting um, our programs uh, across the line. Um, it, last year, we, we did announce that we'd uh, invested in a license uh, around a second-generation cell that um, has enhanced homing technology, for example. Uh, we also have interest in mesenchymal, mesenchymal lineage cells, uh, most likely in combination for some payloading uh, indications. So certainly the whole story with mesenchymal lineage uh, cells is, is just beginning to unfold, and we certainly have interest in next generation activities. 
Great, and maybe just to close, help us um, set the stage for 2018 and, and what we can expect uh, from, from a milestone standpoint and, and mm -hmm. uh, exciting things ahead. So for, for 2018, uh, we're looking uh, at uh, a lot of data. Um, first, uh, the full data from the GVHD program later this year. Uh, data from the LVAD program is uh, due later this year. Um, completion of enrollment of the phase three heart failure program. That is an event driven study. So after enrollment is complete, there will still be a follow up period before uh, we're, we're able to close the database and start analyzing it. And, uh, and we've announced that we've completed enrollment in the chronic low back pain program. That program also has a, a follow up of two years to the end point. So it'll be a little bit further out before we have data in those programs. But certainly we have three programs we're expecting to hear a lot of activity later this year. Great. Well, looking forward to seeing it. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome.